Hello everyone, good to see you all back. This is International Master Asaf Givon here. And today we're going to discuss some um, some heavy piece end games. I want to present you with some very instructive examples uh, which contain some very important aspects and principle in the heavy piece end games. So let me start with this one uh, in front of me. From a game, the, the reason I've, I've chose this example to start with is a typical case of a grandmaster playing with the white pieces and with the black pieces um, playing, okay, let's say an amateur player or significantly lower rated player. And the lower rated player throughout the game, this is only num uh, move number 20, but the lower rated player constantly kept exchanging pieces in this game and hoped to reach an end game and he thought that if he would eliminate a lot of pieces and reach an end game it means that he will have a better chance to draw the game against his uh, superior opponent and as many times is the case this is not necessarily true many times if you eliminate a lot of pieces um, you only might get your opponent which let's suppose he is more experienced or more uh, a stronger player you just help him perhaps to reach a favorable end game like in this case uh, we see an end game of queen and two rooks heavy piece end game uh, which might seem on first glance to be just about equal each side has queen two rooks and six pawns but a closer look will uh, let us know that black has this isolated pawn on d5 and i want to start by saying that in the heavy piece end games pawn weaknesses pawn islands or backward pawns can be extremely significant uh, because uh, it's very easy usually for the uh, for the rooks and queens to attack it so for example in this scenario the pawn on d5 is facing this open file of whites which means that the rooks and the queens can very easily coordinate themselves in order to attack uh, this pawn and black will be basically forced to defend it passively so the game continuation was queen c6 black is trying to get his queen out of the danger zone of the rook out of the open file white played queen d2 very sensible move. White start piling is starting to pile up against uh, the weakened d5 pawn. So black is kind of getting ready to defend this pawn with rook d6, rook d3. You see that also white just by chance is getting basically a perfect formation of queen and two rooks against the pawn. White is very happy to put his queen as the last attacking unit because by the orders of capturing so when white will eventually would like to capture this pawn on d5 he wants his queen to capture last because she's the strongest unit the strongest piece so black played rook f to d8 so at this point we basically we see three attackers versus three defenders but we can see that the black units are fully passive and now white is using this little uh, tactical detail pawn to c4 to eventually win uh, this pawn on d5 now white has a four attacking units versus three and the winning process uh, from this position is actually um, is is fairly a sad position for black the game is not over yet black played h6 to create a luft square for the king white took on d5 and after some exchanges, obviously we know that in the end game, uh, the strong side is happy to exchange pieces. And after rook takes d5, he made a good decision. He took with the pawn actually because queen takes d5 will be perhaps slightly hasty decision because now black can exchange queens. And his king arrives at the pawn um on d5 just in time to eliminate it so that would be a mistake so pawn takes d5 and from this position onwards 
White managed to convert his extra pawn uh, in the end game. We see also that this is a passed pawn, uh, and it's not uh, it's not too difficult for White to win here. Later on, he will perhaps centralize his queen, slowly bring his king into the center, and it should be eventually one game for White. So, going back to the first position, we can see. We can learn from this that any pawn weaknesses or pawn islands or, or isolated pawns in the heavy piece endgame is, could be very significant. So even this position in front of us, which might seem very innocent at first glance, might be even objectively lost for black here just because he has one weak pawn um, more, than, more than white. So keep that in mind. Weak pawns are very significant in the heavy piece endgame. Let's, let us move to the second aspect of uh, the heavy piece endgame I wanted to discuss. So I took here a game of this, in this time, to very strong grandmaster, uh, Gabriel Sargisian with the white pieces, versus Yu Yan Gi, a Chinese grandmaster. Uh, two very strong players. And we see this position in front of us. Once again, a scenario of only heavy pieces are present on the board. Uh, but here we see a slightly different scenario. Here black has no weak pawns, uh, almost at all. You can consider the pawn on b6 slightly weak because he doesn't have the support of a pawn. But all in all, black pawns are fairly safe here. But here we see um, something slightly different. We see basically a scenario when there is only one open file in the game, the C file. And we see that white has full control over it. And not only that he has full control over the C file, his rook has managed to position itself on the 7th rank, also creating some pressure uh, along, the, along this uh, rank. And the main problem for black is that he can never really challenge the rook on the C file without being captured. So black here is basically forced into... Uh, the very sad uh, task of passive defense and still it might be not entirely clear how to win such position because it seems like black is holding on uh, at the moment he's not losing anything uh, immediate but as we shall see this strategic asset of controlling the only open file in a heavy piece endgame is very significant and this position is Probably just strategically winning for white because black doesn't have any counterplay. So let's see how uh, the Armenian Grandmaster Sargisyan manages to improve his position uh, until he eventually breaks through black's defenses. So first of all, because white has such domination in the position, it means that he can uh, choose to do a lot of active operations without too much fear of what black is going to do next. So in order to break through black's defenses, white must find a second front because uh, the C file in itself is not going uh, to win the game. The C file is going to help us to win the game, but we must combine another front or another weakness that we can attack. So White now is going to use his uh, potential pawn breaks on the king side. You see this pawn structure of his is actually very strong because it, it actually denies black from any movements in front of his king. He now played a move pawn to g4. So he is now preparing to storm uh, the black king with his pawns. Uh, I mentioned it in some earlier of my videos, but I'll mention it again. Usually, in order to win in such position, you must use the principle of two weaknesses. Usually, um, it's not enough to only be stronger on one front of the board. We should aim to create another uh, front in order to take advantage of our strategic assets. Black is now fully passive, so on the next move, he just stood in place. King h8. And now, Sargisyan here really took his time, which is which is something I really appreciate. He is not in a rush to win this position. He has all of the time 
in this world to improve his position until the end. So another principle we can put also, this is actually relevant not only in this game, in this end game, but also in general. When we have the advantage, the opponent is fully passive, uh, we need to be very calm to improve our position until the end before we go to any active operations. Why just play the move a4, which is nice because it basically freezes the black pawns on the queen side, so it denies any potential breaks with a4 or b5. Black played once again king g8, standing in place. White plays king f2. The white is still un un uncertain about uh, where his king will go, but this doesn't really matter because he has so much time to make his decisions. The king might go to the queen side, but he also is flexible and might stay on the king side if needed. King h8 was played. And now white played a nice move, queen c6. This is a nice move because if now black is choosing to exchange queens, this hand game will be uh, fairly horrible for black considering that white is controlling the open file and the pawn on b6 is weak. Um, so black tried to keep the queens on the board in order to have some counter chances perhaps later on against the white king. White played king to g3. He is now preparing the eventual break f5 or g5, depends on the circumstances. And he wants his king to be as active as possible before uh, doing this, because as we remember, he has the, uh, the luxury of time. King to g8. Now, after white is fully ready for active operations, he broke with g5. He is now threatening to play uh, g6 with um, lethal consequences to black. Black took on g5, pawn takes g5, and now black played queen d8. And now you see how important it was for white to bring his king to g3, because now the pawn on g5 is under attack, and if white will make the reckless move pawn to g6, he will actually lose the game, because after queen g5 check, suddenly the black queen is becoming very active, she will uh, white is now probably going to lose all of his pawns and actually black is winning. So it is super important that white now has the option of king g4. And we can see now how important uh, it was to activate all of our pieces to the maximum before going to the active operations. And now after king g4 actually also the white king does a very important job of um, defending some important squares. Black played king h8. So now white played queen to b7, basically attacking the spawn, king g8, and now finally, after a lot of preparations, white played the move g6, when black can already resign at this point, because if he takes, it is checkmate to follow very soon after rook takes g7. And if uh, he plays queen e8 like he did in the game. Uh, white can just play the move rook e7, after which the queen is uh, forced to move away when black is uh, losing his f7 pawn. And when the pawn on f7 uh, is gone, the, the whole uh, black position is going to collapse, uh, to collapse uh, very quickly. So black actually uh, resigned at this point. We see here an example of uh, white, basically the stronger side possessing the, the open file. And this by itself is a super important strategic asset which might make a, a, a seemingly drone or, or dry game just winning for the stronger side. And eventually we, we see that white opened up a, a second front with the move g4 in order to eventually break through and create um, the attack on the black king, which leads me to my next example, this one from a very, um, let's say, top level chess, a game of Viktor Korchnoi with the white pieces against Anatoly Karpov with the black pieces, two very big rivals at their time. This is one of the, their more, most, most famous games. 
Once again, we see a scenario of black having queen and two rooks versus uh, versus white's uh, queen and two rooks. But here I want to introduce another very important aspect of this type of endgame, which is the weakness of, uh, of the king. So in this position, in front of us, it's equal material, but black has two very important uh, advantages at his disposal. First of all, the fact that uh, the white pieces are very badly placed, the queen on a1 and the rook on a4, very far away uh, from the action. Also, we see that the white pawns are much weaker uh, than the black pawns. He has he have more he has more pawn weaknesses, but perhaps the most important factor about this position is the weakness of the white king. This king is uh, lacking a defender. If we can just if white can just kind of uh, magically transpo uh, kind of make this pawn transpose it into f2, his king will be fairly safe, but with the absence of this pawn, black is now going to launch an attack against the white king. And this aspect is very important in this type of endgames, because uh, queen and, and two rooks, or even a queen and one rook, as we've seen in the previous example, are a combo or a trio of pieces which has a lot of attacking potential. The, the queen, the strongest piece, and the rook, the second strongest piece, can very easily create a checkmating attack against uh, the king. So here, Karpov played actually a very beautiful move. You might try to find it yourself uh, if you like to stop the video think about it. He wants to attack the white king and he found this rather amazing resource because most of the attacking moves we used to see are very usually they look very aggressive they move forward they sacrifice something but here he find this kind of backward move queen to e8 and in a way those backward moves that are sometimes the most beautiful white is black is basically doing two things here first of all creating the threat of rookie one check winning the white queen but very importantly this move keeps an eye on the rook on a4, which means that the white queen has to stay passively on a1 and cannot uh, assist uh, her own king in the defense. So white was forced to play pawn takes rook, rook takes d2, now the other rook got activated. We see that um, uh, this rook is now going to make a very significant uh, role in this game. Rook takes a5, basically white is now a pawn up, but this pawn on a5 really has no significance, no uh, no import, he's playing no, no role in this game, so black doesn't even mind giving up that pawn. It's now all about the attack against the white king, and we're going to see how the rook and the queen together can coordinate a fairly lethal attack. So black played queen c6 here, creating the threat of checkmate on g2. White played rook a8 check, king h7, queen b1 check, g6, these moves are all rather forcing. And now white played his only move, queen f1, protecting the square on g2 while also actually creating a threat against the pawn on f7. And now this is the time for black's final uh, operations, his final um, blow let's say. Black now needs to find a very important resource. Once again, if you want, you can, might you try and think about it yourself. So this is the move. Queen c5 check. And after king h1, queen d5 check. Basically, uh, we uh, this is called an elevator maneuver. This way you can bring your pieces to the square you want without losing uh, a tempo, because these are all done with the gain of check. And at this point, Korchnoi resigned because after King G1, um, the he loses after the move Rook D1. Uh, taking the Rook is slightly risky because then White takes on F7 and he, and he probably um, has at least a, a good chance of a perpetual check, perhaps even more. But there is no need for this after Rook D1. 
the white queen is lost and so is the game. This is why white resign. So in this example, we basically see how um, the weakness of one king it makes such a big difference. The, once again, the initial position is is almost even uh, symmetrical, but the fact that the pawn on f2 is missing for the white's king shelter, and that all it took for Karpov uh, to take advantage of that and to win the game. So, thank you all for uh, watching this video. Hope you learned something. See you guys next time. Bye-bye.